Terra incognita spectator. Terra incognita spectator. Welcome to this month's Terra Incognita Australian Speculative Fiction Podcast. I'm your host, Keith Stevenson. Put simply, Terra Incognita is the best Australian speculative fiction read by the authors who created it. And please visit tisf.com.au for links to our featured authors' website and publications. This month's writer is Margot Lanigan, who's well known internationally for her dark fantasy. Margot's early success was in YA collections such as White Time and Black Juice, where she built a quick reputation as a unique voice in the Australian speculative fiction field. Since then, she's gone on to cement her reputation on the world stage, well and truly announcing her arrival with a World Fantasy Award for her novel Tender Morsels. Margot wrote the spellbinding novella Sea Hearts for our book imprint Coeur de Leon's well-received anthology X6, and her story for TISF, Flower and Weed, is a prequel to Sea Hearts, and also a bit of an exclusive, because Sea Hearts has inspired her next novel, as yet unnamed, and Flower and Weed is an outtake from that novel, a piece that will not make it into the final version, but which sheds light on the goings-on occurring on that strange island, with the tight-lipped red-haired men, the beautiful dark-haired wives they take, and the strange children they have. I thought I was a happy man. Most beautiful wife in the town I had. Ally, I called her. Ally, that's no saint's name, said Parson Stoush, his hand poised, dripping for the head wetting prior to our wedding. Alleluia, I said, cocky with the joy of it. My own woman in the white. Her hair trussed with flower and weed, both of sea and land, the strange way those women like it. What could be more holy than that? Alleluia, praise the Lord. Truth be told, I'd have had some difficulty telling myself apart from the Lord that day. Anyway, not only her, but three fine sons and four girls, not a seal flipper among them, put back into the sea to make wives for others' sons. Tis the way it is with seal children. The boys has preponderance of the dads, so can survive aboard Roll Rock directly. The girls, though, is more their mams, and once weaned will sicken and die unless you turn them over to seal mamming. I have seen it, men who would not admit, and must eventually put their girls' bodies dead in the earth, or take them too late out on their boat, and deliver them cold and imparceled into the waves. Certainly Ali had her times. They all have times. Blanket after seaweed blanket I have had the witch knit up, for Ali needs the freshest. The longer she lies under it, her warmth drying it out, the less efficacious it becomes. And when there is more weeping than sleeping, well, a man cannot endure it. Such beauty suffering and on his account. But barring those weeks and sometimes months in the winter, all was more than lovely. The children showing Ali and me in, in their colours and manners were great consolations to her and to me, though we would both sink badly when a daughter went back to the sea and it would take all our son's strenuous tea bringings and songs and chivvyings to play slap marble to bring us out of that, first me and then my Ali. Always they could restore us in the end, our lads. Life ran so high and cheerful in them and so kind. But then that red girl came. Our witch Miss Galetha was old and sometimes mad, and she had broke a foot among the crescent rocks that mended badly, as in her madness she did not have it set. We needed someone spryer to do our magics, so Dominic Mallet, only one son to that man, top of how many pups, and one dead girl, how so keen a man could have such poor luck is beyond any of us. Anyway, Dominic went off to mainland and brought her back, this witchlet, who had some instruction from home and were given more by Miss Galetha as to our particular needs. And the first several days, all the talk was how ugly the girl was, and who could remember when all the women on our isle, and daughters too, were as ugly as us, hair like copper wire, skin like someone peppered it, so many freckles, some of us, that they merge in one big freckle on the nose, on each cheek. And the shape of us, see how it went on the women, all bosom and bum, so unsubtly. On and on we went, laughing at her, and at Miss Galetha, that great pudding, dragging her weight around with her stick, with her two sticks eventually, or with the new one pushing her in the new wheeled chair. 
They were not proper women to our eyes, to men that lay with the long women, barely curved at all, all the nights, that untangled ourselves from their hair strands every morning as from a black spider web, that swam in their eyes, some dark as midnight, others netted green or blue or green-blue, depending on the light and their happiness. So we told ourselves, and each other, so I told myself, convinced as any of us. And then I went a-fishing off Angle Shoals for a while, and out there in my bunk one night in the privacy of a storm, when there was no man near me not puking his heart out, I dreamed the girl, the ugly one, into my bed, which was not like any dream, I tell you. Indeed, it seemed my life with Ally, my sons and daughters, were the dream, my nights at Holman's singing, drinking, trading assurances, from which I woke this night, out of the noise of them, and I grasped, I cannot communicate to you the strength and the pleasure of the grasping. Handfuls of her flesh I took, before and behind, pulled back her head by hair like mine, but long, long, tangled like a trap, and her mouth with the freckled lips wide in the ecstasy of being taken. She swallowed me up, her mouth afore laughing and frantic and smelling of flesh, of body, not of sea, and aft her nethers fat and tight and pulsing good red blood till I disappeared myself up and into her and beyond to nothing, only below decks, stinking of piss and vomit, and my fellows suffering, and the dark sliced with shards of swinging lamplight, and the sea beating on our frail home all around. Some dreams stay with you, and this was one, the feeling of it, the uncleanness, yet the detail, things I saw that I had never seen, the pink circle around her nipple, not the purple-brown, the red scrag of her hair's top and bottom, the handfuls of her. I cut my palm badly next day in the calm, trying to forget the handfuls in the burn of net ropes, in the pinch and cold of metal. Animal like me, I called her, watching her in my memory, and I spat the taste of her over the side, but nothing could wipe or wash the feeling of her from down below or from inside me. And when we came back, from the moment Roll Rock came in sight, I was sick alert for the sight of that red head, the hair that I had had my claws in. Two days I did not see her. Then she trundles Mescaletha by, shouting us out of the way, Make way for the honourable witches! The shouting and the merriment of her, that was as strange as the colour. Though I could see in the older witch the very face that the younger would grow into, were they related? Had Dominic known and fetched the girl from cousins or something? Though I could see... This hardly spoiled my view of her at all, and such a rush of memory did I have of that dream, such a recognition of animal like me, that my man leapt up in my trousers, and I had to crouch and pretend I was intent on conversing with Bordis, my youngest, untie his bootlace and uptie it over again, to recover from those thoughts. Perhaps you can see where this led, but I did not, not even as it led there. I did not know I was such an evil man, and so disloyal. I did not know I had this in me. I tell you, one thing not to put in yourself if you are doubting your marriage is the drink. I knew this, but I went up to Holman's from the site of Alley, a mound under drying weedery that would soon have to be replaced, surrounded by wide-eyed boys, all looking up at me. Must you go? And I must, I must get away from her misery, to men who'd got away from their wives, to a rough room and a rowdy, beer-smelling and pipe-smoke clouded, and perhaps with a fiddle-tune or two. So I had filled myself nicely. I was warm with it, too warm, indeed. I could feel I was uncomfortably red, the beer in the roots of my hair. A walk, I told myself, closing Holman's door behind me. That would freshen me up, let me breathe some before I was enwrapped again by that house, that room, that weedy smell and weeping, those lads' big eyes, Lord love them. Down I went through the silent town. You can hear the sea as soon as you step away from the murmur of Holman's. Each house, I imagined, like my own, held children and a mam. The mam woeful abed under her sea blanket, the children next to her consoling, or away in their own beds, their own dream boats, unawise of the mam's troubles, or the dad's if he feels them. House after house crouched unlit from within, awaiting its master the walls bright with the moon, the chimneys bearing ghosts of smoke and no more. I walked as far as the sea, going about its night business of rinsing the beach clean of our footwork to make all freshly treadable for the morning. I leaned on the rail there, at one point, at another, 
and looking up I saw not a lamp in all the village but for the snug window at Holman's, not a movement in the street, even so much as someone's cat, not even so much as a mouse along the bottom of Fisher's wall. I turned my way then, stupidly, fatefully, drunkenly, though I was not so drunk that I did not know better, towards the east, and I walked the road out, and soon the hill rose and obscured me from Potshead eyes, such as should choose then to glance out their lit or unlit window. Shaw Cottage showed all lights, all three windows warm. After all this night and moon and ocean swill, t'was hard not to see that as a welcome. As I come up the house, her shadow crossed one of the curtains and stopped there and stilled my breathing, and I heard her sing, not more than a croon, and I could not place the tune it was so partial and poorly rendered. But our seal wives have spoiled us, haven't they, for song? With their own songs so weird and odd harmonied, they have made what we once took pleasure in seem lumpish, seem obvious. They have shamed us into keeping our music up at Holman's only, and beer the only excuse for it. How long I stood waiting for her to cross again, I don't know. The sight had shivered me deep in my dream again. The thought of the substance that made that shadow, the unformed cloud of hair, tied up hasty so as not to impede whatever witch work she was about. The bottom that the apron bow sat upon, like a shelf. At any rate, I was still there, summoning up courage to knock or strength enough to flee, when out she came spirited, bursting out the door she come with a slop bucket making me jump, and crosses the yard and empties it to the pigs. And there was no cover here but for the house itself. And besides, I was thrown again, of course, the sight of her curves and corners, the bluster of her, the life, the speed of movement. So as when she turned about, having slapped the bucket bottom with her short hand and laughed at and scratched the head of the young sow that came up for the night's treat, there I was, a great gawp in the moonlit road. Silence swallowed us a minute. Trudel balanced on one foot. Then, hark, she said softly, and lowered her bucket, and took four steps in her side-to-side -side way, into the shade of the house so that the moon would not dazzle her. Which one are you? she said out of there, curiously. There was not the littlest note of fear in her voice. I said nothing, then or later. I think somehow I thought that if I did not speak, I'd not be committing anything. Out she come into the moonlight, right up to me, and turned me, her hands on my arm and hip. I don't know you, she said, up at my moon-glown face. She was there in the road before me, and us all alone. The whole package of her held tight in her cloths, the hair, as I said, too frazzled almost to shine. Miserable, though, aren't you? You're all miserable, this town, what you have brung on yourselves. My blood were beginning to run and glow towards my middle. Even with her face in shadow, I could see the freckleness, and her hands on her hips. That was not a stance our ladies took very often. Tall, though, ain't you? She said up at me, the tip of her nose in moonlight. Here, come to this stump, and she led me, not touching, far side of the road. Help me up, she commanded, and I had her hard little hand in mine, as up on a root ridge, up on a sawn-off branch, she stepped like steps to the stump top. Close in here, she said, peremptory with her child hand. Have you a name? I shook my head, there all moon-washed before her shadowy self. If I did not say, perhaps it would not be me that did this thing. It would be her only, and I could not be held to account for it. She stared a while at me, smelling of cheese-making maybe, and pig slops just a touch, but not of the sea and sadness. Then she took my head, the rustle of the clothing on her, her cold hands on and behind my ears. She brought me to her mouth, gave me a little kiss, just lips, and then a longer, regarding me between. I could not read her shadowed eyes, only see the shine of my own face in their curvings. There was the moment between the second kiss and the third, when I might have broke from her, she knew it and I knew it, when I might have walked away, and neither of us the worse for how far we'd gone. We hung in that moment, her hands light against my ears, one of them rubbing, her round face all attention. Then she took me against her, one hand back of my ribs, and the other slid behind my head and we kissed again, and this time both of us opened and delved in each other's mouths. Her tongue was rough nearly as a cat's. She might as easily have licked along my bum cleft to my balls, so immediate was the effect there. And I committed something. I raised my arms behind her. 
I put one at her waist, I settled the other in her hair, crunch crushing it to her head, so that even if she released me, I would still have her there, drinking heat from her mouth, trading wetness with her. I pressed her to me, to the state of my man, a way I never did my wife, that must be wooed with words and gentleness, that must be persuaded. This one needed no cajolment. Ah, you! She pushed from me, pulled from me, grinned. Down her hand slid to my buttock and pressed there. She pushed her bosom against my chest and drank another draught from my mouth. Through my trues, through her skirt, I was in the divide of her legs, those white, those rounded legs I had seen and felt in my dream. I took the handfuls of her through the skirt that I remembered and desperate hard, so that she cried out surprised and broke from me long enough so as I could see she was pleased by it too. Where can we go, I nearly said, but she interrupted me between thought and word. The old bitch is asleep, but she sleeps light. Come down, I helped her down off the stump. Over this wall, she led me along to the stile, and along away. That there, you see, is the deaf side of the house, which it was, windowless, conscienceless, and she placed herself in the moon between me and the field wall, and unbibbed her apron, and took out her bosom from her blouse, which were just as I dreamed it, two squashy moons, with nipples down below, still managing pinkness even in that cold light. I fell upon them as a starved man to a square meal, suck and bite and bruise and clutching them. I brought her down, back to the wall, and above me she gasped and the cries broke from her, and she held my head tight to her with my hair, and found my hand and forced it between her legs where she bore against it like sea ice rising and collapsing to a prow, and groaned up at the stars. It were good as my dream, and better, fuller, fatter, tighter, smellier. I chewed her ear, I licked her face, I pulled her hair with my teeth. I slapped her quivering ass, then ground my hand prints into the stones of the field. I put my man to every part of her and burst there. I painted her bosom with my leavings as she rubbed herself to bursting on my knee and thigh below. Oh, you filth, she said in glee to me. Oh, you bad man, yes, harder than that. Oh, on and on we went. And there was no shame in it, no shame. We were two animals sporting in a field. We might have gone all night, but that at one moment of our resting there came through the darkness a thin cry that I thought was a cat's, but that electrified her from where she had lain, her face buried up the crotch of me, my bull's balanced side of her nose, and her tongue lax against the bunghole of me. Bugger! She sprang up and was dressing fast as I'd ever seen a person dress, and sure, that's her. She'll not rest till she sees me. I must go. Bare-bosomed, she tied on her skirt, then quick as a wink stepped over my head and sat down, and while she busied her blouse ends above, she were rubbing my face with her wet hot nethers in the dark there. I made to put my finger in a rear her, but she was up and off already. She mashed her face to mine in a laughing kiss. That were grand, whoever you are. Quick but oh so gently, she took the whole of my shrunken man in her mouth and released it and kissed it, and then she was just her beskirted bum and flying apron strings and a bustle at the stile and thuds away and the old biddy crying, Trudel, where have you got to, curse your wandering ways? I lay coldening until the murmurs of the two women were clapped away behind the cottage door. Well, seemed to say the stars and the moon, look at you now. What were all that about so hot and close under our immensities? And while I thought on that, I tipped myself a little on the sloping field until I rolled over, and tipped myself again, and lengthed my arms above my head and rolled over and over down the grass and old cowpats, down the stones, stars and grit in my eyes, grass whispering, and the earth just as cold and hard as when she'd pressed me into it, crushing the jerkings out of herself as you crush the heat out of a coal or the juice from a blackberry bead. I fetched up against the bottom wall, laughing in a choking way, flecked all over grass and gravel, stars, dizzy streaks above me. Up I got and fetched my clothing, flattened to the ground under our meetings as it had been. I peeled it off and carried it down the field, down the next field, down the road, down the cliff path to the corner beach. Shook out the grass there and left it at the highest rock. Walked down and washed myself in the sea which was kind to me and stung and solaced all my wounds and bruises, numbed my chafed parts, foamed in my hair. I scrubbed the slick of her off me with sand. I bucked and rolled myself in the little waves. I was mad with what I had done, sick to my stomach and carefree both. 
Great armfuls of the ocean I embraced groaning, and it hugged me back, cold and lively, buoying me up one moment, dropping me with a sigh the next. I went to Trudel two times more the month following, but then my self-disgust grew greater than I could manage, and I swore myself off her and kept to my own wife only, to my home and my family. I seen her about the place, though. At first I was worried she might leer and wink at me and give me away that way, for she never showed much intelligence, and she had a mouth on her besides, always ready with a smutty saying or a comment on events before her. But she treated me same as she treated all, as if we were as a group entertainment for her or nuisances like a sheep flock in the road, but did not exist man and man. The women she managed to render invisible, never lighting her eye on them, but only the husbands and lads. Cheerful we were, and rude. Some of us could remember old mess that way. Still, it was a shock when Trudel strode among the market, mouthing. Shift your asses, I've to buy my meat, she'd say, and I could not tell where it my guilt did this or where it true. The very air lit up with her careless straightness, with the impertinence of her bosom and bumness pushing through the blockish men, the narrow women in their dark dresses. Trudel began fattening within a week or so of the last time I seen her. When first I noticed, the market fell silent around me, and the sea. I watched her lean across, arguing and laughing with Daisy Cormorant over turnips, and the breath whooshed out my lungs so they lay in my chest like bagpipes put aside at wedding feast's end. I swung away from the sight so that all would be as usual before my eyes. I found air to breathe and a stall pole to lean on, and a shiver rushed up my back and over my head, and people were gabbing and bargaining all around me again, louder, it seemed, for the silence that had gone before. I pulled myself together. No woman shows that fast, I told myself, though I could not truly remember, only having noticed clear when my own Alleluia began our Deirdre, and perhaps redheads were different in their cooking up of babs. I went about in terror several months, expecting her against my own reasoning at my door, claiming her largeness as my doing, demanding money of me, or at least my acknowledging what I'd done on her. I dreamed it several times and woke up sweated and protesting. Kona, said Ali, next me. Nothing, I said. Tricks of my mind. And I would lie there trying to keep my body restful, trying not to tighten up and fidget as I worried, so as Ali would not ask me my trouble. Trudel did not come, though, but went about growing and growing and accusing no one, cheerful as ever. The women, if they talked of it, talked only among themselves, and I would be surprised if they did, for they do not gossip, that is one of their advantages. They brought that restfulness to Roll Rock, that each other's business weren't being bruited about the town all the live long. And their quietness on it must have infected the men, for I did not hear any word about it till the day, early winter it was, with the first snow bagged up in the clouds and ready to fall any time, when Trotter swings into Holman's for his cider and spirit and leaks it to the bar in a slow moment. I hear that Trudel got delivered of a fine girl. Did she now, says old Cranach, who's never a bad word to say of any, and will not hear one either. Carrot hair already, says John Rick, and a fine thatch of it. He saw Trudel sunning her out crescent this morning. She's come up well after then, remarked someone, I think it was Flossie, to be out walking already. I and we nodded and raised our eyebrows approving all along the bar and pushed out our lips, as we knew, husbands and fathers, all about that, women's confinement, women's recovery, women's fragility after birthing, didn't we now? That's grand, said Cranach generously, a healthy daughter and the ma'am up and walking about. We cannot wish for more than that. Indeed, Michael takes up the cry, well done of her. And in that instant it was agreed, I think, the bab was Trudel's, and the question of the father could hang. Nobody needed to know, and I never heard speculation of that, or any of Trudel's babs to follow, not from any man. We had a whip round there and then for the mam and bab, and as we all delved and clinked our bit of beer money onto the pile, I felt it happen, watching Cranach put his piece in happily, watching young Bandy pay, who was still in the dazzle of early marriage and never would have slunk down shore cottage as I did, as someone else of us did. Every man would put in a little, so as the guilty could contribute, could atone for themselves and compensate, without identifying themselves by it. No one would glance about, no one would mark too closely what was paid by whom. No one would speak of this transaction, or the next. We would all instead absorb the new bab into our larger family that was the town, maintaining her as we maintained her mam and Mescaletha. 
We were curious, of course, about a girl child. Had the bab been a lad, perhaps our generosity might not have been as instant. A daughter that could be kept, instead of sent away, for keeping as a stranger among strangers. A girl toddler, and a girl sprout, and a girl solemning towards womanhood. That would be a thing to witness, such a creature among us. We did not want a scandal and an argument, and for Trudel to take the girl in a huff back to where she come from. The bab belonged here. She was one of ours, one of us, and we would pay to keep her near. Terra incognita speculative reviews. This month's review book is Siren Beat by Tansy Rena Roberts. Siren Beat is the next offering, published as a double with English author Robert Shearman's Roadkill in Twelfth Planet Press's ongoing and highly entertaining novella series. Tansy is a well-known author in the Australian scene, with a broad range of fantasy short stories to her credit and a forthcoming fantasy series, The Creature Court, from Harper Voyager. Siren Beat takes as its premise the encroachment on the chilly Hobart landscape of a pair of sirens intent on sucking the life out of as many Taswegians as they can lay their borrowed hands on. In their way stands crippled but still formidable guardian Nancy Napoleon, who's been around for a long time, several centuries it seems, and doesn't take kindly to sirens, mermaids, krakens or other supernatural sea forms preying on the good citizens of her adopted city. It's a scenario you could be forgiven for thinking is quite familiar, but Tansy's writing elevates this story above what you might expect and takes full advantage of the space the novella form provides. Nancy has a complex history, not all of which remains conveniently in the past. There's people she'd rather forget, not least sometime Kelpie Nick Cadmus, whose relationship with her dead sister and fellow monster fighter Sylvie, as well as with herself, causes no end of hurt, resentment and even guilt. Cadmus, too, is more than what he seems, scarred by Sylvie's death in ways even Nancy doesn't suspect at first. And then there's Sylvie herself, dead and gone, a painful memory only, or perhaps something more. The sirens which afflict Hobart are another delightful surprise, given a 21st century makeover that is at once startlingly fresh and, when you think about it, so obviously right. Put on top of all that, a third act that you definitely won't see coming, and I can confidently say that Siren Beat is a standout novella from a very accomplished writer. Four stars. Siren Beat by Tansy Rayner Roberts is published in Australia by Twelfth Planet Press. You have been listening to Terra Incognita Australian Speculative Fiction Podcast. Visit tisf.com.au for links to the featured author's websites and for details of the publications. Stories are copyright by the author. Book reviews are copyright Keith Stevenson, 2010. This podcast is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 Australian license. See our website for details. Please tune in next month for another podcast of the best Australian speculative fiction read by the authors who created it.